All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for hanging around. I know we're jumping on just a couple minutes late here. I want to welcome everyone to the 16th installment of the Regional Report, a GPEC virtual series. Uh, today's topic will discuss an expansion strategy that drives jobs, a very um, in-depth nerve center report coming up from uh, President and CEO of GPEC, Chris Camacho. Uh, again, thank you for your time joining us this morning. My name is Eric Sperling. I am the managing director here at the Social Television Network. If you're not familiar with STN, we are a local media company based in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a streaming network that you can download, as you can see right there, uh, from the App Store or Google Play. All of our shows and segments are dedicated to local leadership, uh, community growth, and actionable solutions. And that is where we met GPEC and partnered with them and their CEO, Chris Camacho, um, for this virtual series. I uh, want to mention we do have some upcoming GPEC events that we want to make you aware of. The GPEC Ambassador Program will be hosting a virtual social hour on Wednesday, July 29th from 4 to 5 p.m. That will be done via Zoom. This is an exclusive event for GPEC investors. Uh, if you're not a GPEC investor but would like to learn more, please reach out to the engagement team. You can see Nicole's email on your screen right there. Uh, we will announce future regional reports soon, but you can always check out past installments by visiting gpec.org backslash blog. Okay, if this is your first time joining one of these regional reports, we have some quick housekeeping items we wanna run through. Today's webinar will run for approximately one hour. Audience members are muted and without video. This webinar is being recorded and will be shared on the GPEC website and social media. You may submit questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen due to time constraints though. We may not be able to get to all those questions and should you experience any technical difficulties, try the old logging out, logging back in, see if that works. And then we invite you to share this information on social media. Please feel free to tag GPEC and use the hashtag greaterphxtogether where appropriate. Okay, today's regional report will be structured into two sections. To start, we're gonna have a brief overview from our panelists, and then that'll be followed up by some live Q&A. I wanna introduce the four amazing panelists we have today. Chris Camacho, President and CEO of GPEC, I've mentioned you a few times already. Andrew Howard, CEO of Kudelski Security. Uh, Peter Kropik, Vice President of Customer and Product Support and CIO at Honeywell Aerospace. And Gino Toromazati. Uh, Gino is the Director at H5 Data Centers. But first, before we get to the rest of the panel, I wanna bring Chris Camacho in because Chris, I know that's been a long time coming. You've been working hard on that Nerve Center report and we'll give the floor to you now. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, excited to be here with all of you. I know we have uh, a few hundred folks uh, within the greater Phoenix region joining us today. Uh, I am excited to talk about nerve centers, this uh, uh, review of modern shared services models across the US. And I'm gonna give a little more color to that report uh, here in a moment. But before we do so, uh, I wanted to, you know, first of all, thank all the, the frontline healthcare workers that are out there continuing to ensure that we're safe, our families are safe, our companies can get back uh, you know, to producing revenue and, and products, uh, Arizona made products. And so uh, before diving deeper into this report, there was a JLBC, a joint legislative budget uh, committee report placed today, uh, excuse me, earlier this week that referenced a forecast on the market. And uh, early on before or during the pandemic, there was a uh, a forecast that referenced about a $630 million deficit was predicted. Uh, and I believe it was yesterday, uh, the numbers came back for our June 30 state uh, close date, and, and we're looking closer at a 2.3% decline. So not, not near as bad as what was anticipated. So obviously Arizonans are still spending money. I can tell by my front porch that's still happening. As we see uh, deliveries come in, it seems like on, our, on a routine basis, but I'll leave you with kind of in the broader economic state, I'd still encourage as I have on, I think the other 15 of, of these webcasts, please continue to go support local businesses. Uh, we're not out of the, the woods yet. And obviously the pandemic is uh, still working its way through our system, but let's ensure we're supporting locally owned businesses at this time. Um, so first uh, on the nerve center side, uh, again, some of you are probably puzzled by even the term nerve center, which I'll explain here in a moment, but it, it goes without saying that the GPEC team during this very tumultuous time uh, across all fronts, whether it's business development or marketing communications, research and competitiveness, uh, our team has, has really been focused on uh, sharing information, ensuring that uh, our community, our partnership with the cities and, and private sector, uh, we're still advancing the economy. 
and uh, Drew Callow was the, the author of this report that, that I'll summarize today along with the research and marketing team that put this together. So let's go ahead. I've got a few slides that kind of illustrate uh, directionally where we're going and I want to take you on the journey uh, as I saw this uh, evolve, uh, not necessarily firsthand, because it started in, in really the early 80s into the late 80s prior to the SNL crisis, where you had uh, a mass amount of job growth in the greater Phoenix region was anchored uh, by customer service and sales centers evolving here. And, you know, you could go through the list of names of those centralized customer service locations. Uh, but what we were seeing in the 80s was this transition away from these hubs across the U.S., primarily for affordability reasons and labor concentration access, uh, growth in the, in the late 80s that then shifted into the early 90s, where you started seeing some level of, of concentration of multi-business units. But uh, what I was seeing is, if, if you recall, uh, early 2000s, I was actually in Yuma, Arizona, which would be categorized as a third and fourth and third tier market, uh, but also fourth tier markets across the U.S. were starting to see um, footprint locations from corporate America, and that might have been an isolated sales or I isolated IT or customer service operation, um, but what Phoenix was continuing to do was grow uh, multi-business units in the region. So instead of one isolated location, you were starting to see uh, more of these centralized functions. What we've really seen in the last 12 years is this dramatic shift. And, and fortunately for all of us, the, the economic diversi diversification strategy post uh, the last downturn, we, we've really uh, hyper-focused on growing not only base industries, but higher valued uh, business units and jobs. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So this transition to nerve centers, if you uh, go to the next slide here, slide eight will reference uh, you know, a little bit more about, you know, definition of a nerve center. And we, we talked about this for some time as, as, you know, I'm out on the front lines along with our business development team, interacting with corporate and, and really global uh, companies. And what we were finding, whether it's, you know, examples of, of Honeywell or Kadelsky or any of these other major corporations here, they're adding high value units into the greater Phoenix region. When I say high value, they're generally industries of the future, industries 4.0. So think of them as cybersecurity, mission critical. Uh, they're no longer the cost optimized focus of the company to come here for cheap labor, but rather coming here for the qualified labor with the redundant infrastructure that allows, allows these business units to evolve because now they're the backbone of many of these companies. And so, it used to be that the greater Phoenix region would compete with other low cost locations, say Salt Lake City or San Antonio. Uh, but what I've seen in really the last decade, you know, we're on the horizon with the Dallas, the uh, you know, Metro Atlantas, the Charlottes that not only have pro-business approaches to, uh, from a policy standpoint, but also have continued to scale labor in a way that makes it attractive uh, to grow and scale here and add really dense business unit activity here. And, and I, I expect for us to see that in years to come. So go ahead. So when we talk about a modern shared services definition, you, you know, obviously we have to look at what occurred in the early 2000s. These, these reference points to BPOs and outsourcing of U.S. jobs to other locations. I mean, it, depending upon which indices you utilize, there's been projections of uh, you know, a couple million to uh, eight to nine million jobs that have been outsourced uh, over the last decade, decade and a half. And with the more recent uh, focus on uh, regrowing or, or even reshoring uh, U.S. jobs, we've seen policy changes uh, in the last four years that have really made the U.S. more competitive. But at the same time, there's been customer preference to shift uh, some of these jobs back to the U.S. And at the same time, kind of the, the main common denominator of success is quality labor pools, along with really strong redundant infrastructure. So that's fiber and other digital infrastructure, um, coupled with, you know, the, the amenity base that exists in a community. And so you see in the U.S. here, probably some other countries that maybe haven't been on your radar, but places like Poland, uh, have strong engineering bases in Warsaw. India obviously uh, has, has strengthened over the last 25 years in its engineering prowess, but 
we are seeing some of the shift back to the U.S., uh, but we're also seeing domestic growth. And as the United States continues to grow as, a, as the nerve center or shared services model, Greater Phoenix is actually going to do really well in its market share position, which I'll talk about here in a moment. The other kind of facet that we won't have a lot of time to talk about today is this, this remote worker model. And obviously, since COVID, that has reshaped the way that operation centers are thinking about deployment of labor. One of the unique trends, and again, I won't touch on this deeply today, but that we're seeing out of California is that these kind of high growth tech companies, as well as corporate services enterprises, if you're a non-customer facing employee, a lot of these employees are going to be leaving California and, and looking at other locations where they can, you know, not only buy homes, but have different lifestyle attributes. And for the company, if they can still maintain the employment base, what I'm hearing from VCs and, and other corporations are that the, the new now is going to be a blended workforce. Some work from home, some work from office. So we'll, we'll unpack that hopefully at a later time, but I think that's a really important piece of this modern shared services trend. Go ahead. Just have a few more slides for you. So when we talk about this paradigm shift, there was an inherent focus for the last 20 years on cost and, and accessing labor, labor environments that had lower what we call TCO, total cost of operations. And centralizing operations were important, but uh, primarily that was a cost basis. What we're seeing in this new era, kind of post the last recession, and, and obviously the one we're in today, is really about business transformation, digital transformation. And it's about leaning out costs, but it's also about advancing productivity and adding innovation layers so that integration can occur between business units. So what I'm forecasting for the Metro Phoenix region, no longer are you seeing disparate operational units of, of corporate enterprises. You're seeing integrated uh, multi-unit locations uh, and, and standalone units of corporate America that are evolving as very central nerve center, if you will, high value technology assets to the company's enterprise. And that's a really good sweet spot to be because we've had a long legacy of talent disposition coupled with pro-business policy. So I expect this to occur and actually seeing more and more companies doubling down on this market, even if they have a singular, singular operational post, I think you're gonna see you know, more business units come to this market and, and centralize in, into these integrated process hubs. Go ahead. So let's look at the, you know, unpack the Metro Phoenix market. You can see the densification of where these locations are. They're around the infrastructure spine, so the transportation uh, spines of the region. Probably no big surprise when you map uh, where these nerve centers are located. They're generally following the same employment center nodes that we've talked about in previous webcasts. So in, er or in Metro Phoenix, we have roughly 90 plus employment nodes with 3,000 employees or more. So very different from other locations where you have very spread out employment nodes. But you can see in and around the airport along the 101 loop, around the 101 and, and 17 Deer Valley area, and you can see the different uh, locations where these are. Now, obviously the, the transportation access from a labor standpoint, but also the digital and physical infrastructure. So that's everything from you know, power and, and you know, digital capabilities also drive where these uh, physical facilities are. Now, some of these are manufacturing, some of these are advanced IT, some of these are cybersecurity, and some of them are network uh, and security operations centers as well as mission critical data center facilities, which you'll hear about uh, from one of our panelists today. Go ahead. So the, the composition of these jobs uh, obviously are very significant to our community. You can see as the breakdown here across the screen, uh, over the last five years, we've been one of the top job markets for finance and insurance job growth. Uh, you, you also will see that nerve center job growth is also growing at a rapid pace. And what's important in, in all of the data analysis on this is it's not necessarily as companies are thinking about locations, it's no longer about being the cheapest place. It's really about a combination of being affordable, coupled with the strong labor deployment, which we'll get to the recommendations here in a second, but strong labor deployment, coupled with modern infrastructure, coupled with pro-business policies. If you can create that nexus where you're focused on all four of those areas and creating world-class communities, you're gonna win in this formula. And so that's what we're heavily focused on here at the regional level and working with Governor Ducey and our state partners at the Arizona Commerce Authority. Uh, this work never stops. So one example of this is 
uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, for example, with their major new fab being announced here, much of their supplier base now is looking at this market. We need to ensure that our economic development programs align with major OEMs and supplier ability or supplier traction ability so we can continue to grow and cultivate the next generation of semiconductor jobs in our region. So I think I just have a few more slides here and then I look forward to getting to the panel. So typically, you know, I, I actually did this this morning on a UK podcast. I gave the pitch on why Greater Phoenix. I won't go through that today, uh, but you know, if you want to take this offline, I'd be happy to talk with you about every one of these specific uh, nodes matter to building a world-class region. And, you know, obviously you have to play to your strengths of having a strong technology base. We're a maturing, young, fast-growing market. And what's different from the era of really the 60s and 70s, and go back to the example of, you know, Ford, Chrysler, all these, you know, legacy automotive companies, they actually moved where they could and get the best return on capital and the employees would follow, the labor force would follow. Today that's dramatically shifted where companies are deciding where to locate based upon the quality of the community and the strong labor pool and ensuring that the modern infrastructure exists. So you have to build on all of these nodes and ensure that you know, you're producing against all these areas. So again, I won't go through them today, but you can read the eight areas that really matter to us. Go ahead. So let's talk about what's ahead. And this is a conclusion of the report because I think this is really important that we, we don't rest on our laurels as a great growth market that has transitioned away from construction and, and you know, home building, which is an additive aspect of our economy now as opposed to the, the primary aspect of our economy. And we must continue to produce STEAM talent or STEM talent. And that's really a P through 20 model, probably even more exacerbated now with this focus on digital delivery of education, applied learning, I would hope that we continue to advance down the path of alternative uh, methods of learning. Because I do believe as, as we're in the COVID era and there's uncertainty around schools and reopenings and all of that, we must continue with, you know, I go back to University of Phoenix or ASU online, all of these delivery systems have enabled us to lead in the digital delivery of education. But with that said, our educational attainment must improve. We, we must address the digital divide. We must uh, provide access, better access for more of our low income students to get on that uh, education pathway to create economic value for our future. So that's a big area for us that we must continue. Next is uh, investing not only in basic infrastructure, water, wastewater and roads, but future digital infrastructure. The reason why we as a region created the connective was to ensure that uh, this, this new enterprise that would connect all of our cities with universities that would enable us to test smart technology and deploy st uh, smart technology at scale. And we're in the early stages of this process, but really critical that we're continuing to heavily bet on digital infrastructure, 5G and beyond, because that's what's going to enable our companies to continue to grow and scale. The last uh, couple areas are the cultivation of pro-business policies. Again, every market's attempting to do that today. We need to stand side by side with companies like you're going to hear from today and help problem solve areas of, of everything from workforce liability and, and regulatory policy to the advancement of, of you know, regulatory areas like enabling smart contracts like we did a couple years ago to um, a lot of the um, sandboxes that we created around you know, financial tools. So we want to be on the cusp of emerging technologies and allowing those to evolve in our region. And then lastly, urban development and mobility, the creative class has more options than ever before of where they want to live and where they want to work. And particularly the remote working segment of this new era, we need to ensure that we're promoting connectivity, we're promoting access uh, from a public transit standpoint, and even the way we're looking at zoning within our urban centers. We have a lot of new product being built uh, in the urban cores or along the, the kind of major corridors in our region that promote density. And a lot of the creative class is seeking that. So we want to ensure that, that this uh, report becomes a primer for action, that we continue to grow and scale these nurtured uh, business units that create massive economic value. One thing I'll leave you with, because this is really hot off the press uh, analysis that Kristen Stevenson and her research team on, uh, within our group have analyzed. When we, when we bring a new knowledge worker to the market or a new knowledge worker job is created, 
at say an $80,000 average wage in IT or software or cyber or, or well above that. But an $80,000 wage earner creates about three and a half times the net new tax generation than the median income earner at 38,000. So just put that in perspective, the more knowledge workers we bring and, and the more educated workers we bring to our market, the more tax revenue that that generates for our communities. And so we wanna do our best, not only to attract companies from around the world, but grow and, and cultivate the next generation of new intellectual property from Greater Phoenix. And so I'm really excited about sharing the full report with you uh, going forward. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions as we get Eric towards the end of our panel uh, today, but I'm really excited to hear from the other panelists as it relates to their key business operations uh, residing here in Greater Phoenix. Absolutely. Thank you as always, Chris. And Chris just mentioned the Q&A feature. So please remember that that is available at the bottom of your screen. Um, Chris did mention uh, Honeywell in his presentation and let's bring Honeywell into the conversation now. Uh, Peter Kropik is joining us. Peter currently serves as the Vice President of Customer and Product Support and Chief Innovation Officer at Honeywell Aerospace. He has a proven track record in deploying new and emerging technologies with differentiated and end user experiences. <laughs> So Peter, uh, on the heels of what Chris was just talking about, let's bring you into the conversation now and give you the floor. Yep, perfect. No, uh, appreciate the time and good morning, everybody. And uh, big shoes to follow there from Chris's uh, introduction there. So um, as, as, as was mentioned, I am currently leading a customer product support organization and the chief information officer for Honeywell Aerospace. Um, Honeywell Aerospace has had a long history in the greater Phoenix area, um, going back over 100 years through a history of Sperry to Honeywell to the Allied Signal. Um, we have a large footprint, um, five major facilities in the greater Phoenix area, as well as two additional ones around the state and over 10,000 employees. So it is a significant investment from us, from not only from a global uh, headquarters for aerospace, but overall Honeywell International. Um, we, we, like many organizations, have looked to optimize our operations over the years. And so we talk about the, the um, evolution of shared services organizations. Honeywell has taken that those um, those steps over the years, like you'd expect. Um, you know, we, we tend to look at, you know, how our manufacturing works and how do we bring new workers in the organization, but also how we drive our back office, back office automation. Um, we traditionally have looked at it just like the report says around, you know, how do we drive for costs and efficiencies, you know, in a very traditional um, HR procurement, finance, customer support areas. But one of the things that has really started to change, and, and Chris mentioned this, is how do we start to transform ourselves into driving value in these areas? And, and, and I can use my, my role and my, my um, organization as an example. You know, we, we, we have centralized all of our support organizations from an order management and technical support perspective, and it was very transactional by nature. But over the last few years, we've really focused a lot of um, attention around bringing in new and different skill sets. Um, specifically around uh, automation, technology, AI, machine learning. And, and the other piece that's inside of here too is around business process optimization and automation. So really with the intent of how do we move beyond the transactional into the value creation for our customers? And so how do we think about becoming more proactive versus just reactive? And so what that's led us down the path of, not just in the support organization, but in many of these areas, is how do we bring in these new and different skill sets and how do we continue to invest in those areas there? So again, you know, leveraging, leveraging technologies. And as we found in, inside of here, especially with our large presence here, um, Phoenix has been a very, gr uh, very good um, bed to bring in these skill sets. And especially as the technology sector has continued to grow and um, we've continued to see more and more opportunity to bring in those, those skill sets. Um, we continue to build out beyond the back office. Um, we have a, a very large uh, manufacturing and engineering footprint as well. Um, as I said, you know, 10,000 employees and seven facilities. Um, and, you know, the innovation that we drive through our engineer, engineering centers of excellence, of which there are a number of them here in Phoenix, both from our avionics perspective and an engineering perspective, means we're leaning on those same kinds of technologies, like I said, machine learning and analytics and software to really drive our product development activities. Um, same thing can be said on a manufacturing footprint where we're moving from just how do you move product and material through the factory to how do we put the new smart factory in place, IoT 4.0, really leveraging technologies and skills to really drive our efficiencies in a different way. All of these, be it the engineering, manufacturing, or back office, um, all requiring us to really think differently around process, around skill sets, 
and really the, the individuals that, get, that are going to be necessary to really drive us into the future. And it's a different skill set than we've been looking for, say, over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And so, um, you know, higher capability, um, higher technology uh, knowledge, you know, the knowledge worker um, messaging that, that I heard in, in the intro introduction there is really a key in, inside of everything there. So um, looking forward to, to hearing more questions. I just want to provide, like I said, a brief overview of kind of where we are and what we're doing. I um, want to kind of keep it short there and look for questions. Uh, but, but fundamentally, you know, where we're looking to drive is, is in evolving our, our employee base and evolving the organizational skill sets and capabilities to really leverage um, what's emerging in the market to really start to differentiate itself and a lot of the business processes that we have housed here in Phoenix. Thank you, Peter. And yeah, please stick around. We do have some uh, questions coming in specific for you, but I do want to transition now into data centers and bring Gino into the conversation. Uh, quick intro on Gino. He is an Army veteran with over 20 years of mission critical infrastructure experience, specializing in assisting enterprises and leveraging innovation technology. He has worked with a range of industries, including telecom, healthcare, financial services, energy, and more. And he currently orchestrates national sales strategies at H5 data centers. So Gina, thank you so much for joining us this morning and we'll give the floor to you for a few minutes. Hey, thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate that introduction and uh, thanks everybody and, and, and welcome to this webinar today. This is a privilege to be next to such illustrious panel. Um, by way of introduction, you may have not heard of H5 data centers. Um, H5 data centers is one of the leading and largest privately owned wholesale data center companies in the United States. We have 13 sites and uh, 13 strategic markets, specifically Phoenix, that we're gonna be speaking about today. Quickly approaching 3 million square foot of mission critical space under management. We're a very flexible entrepreneurial and nimble team, uh, wholesale data center infrastructure focus with a long-term outlook. Uh, currently headquartered in Los Angeles, California. Um, taking a look at the entire map of our footprint today, if we go to the next slide, you can see the concentration of data centers on the West Coast. And this slide talks about our edge data center presence in the start locations. And then the square locations manifest and illustrate the enterprise data center footprint. Uh, as you can see, Phoenix is right smack in the middle. Uh, and that is for no coincidence. We'll talk a, a little bit about that as we move along. If we can go to the next slide, we can quickly take a look at our site in Chandler. It's conveniently located next to the Price Tech Corridor. It's a highly sought after area for high end enterprises are looking for this sort of a scalability to be able to run mission critical applications in a very resilient, reliable and secure manner. Uh, this particular campus is a state of the art, is 108,000 square foot fully built. It has a future substation that will take us up to 30 megawatts of critical space, which is uh, overscaled for uh, 180,000 square foot facility. But today we've actually expanded our site as, as um, uh, Q1 2020 and launched a new building so that it would be our West Wing building, building A accommodating up to nine megawatts of mission critical space available for, for leasing. Um, in this particular site, we can offer several flavors of wholesale data center collocation, starting with a turnkey space in building B, where we can accommodate 20 or 40 or a multitude of private suites that can be interconnected for larger footprints as well as the large halls now being offered at 1.5 megawatts uh, increments in building A. And then subsequently we can uh, deploy and build a brand new facility from the ground up uh, where it would be sort of a PowerShell model where a company can come and make a capital in, in, uh, expenditure of their own or they can rely on H5 to finance that. So if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things that I wanted to make clear is that we're very much in tune with uh, the GPEC. We actually came to market because we shared the same vision and mission. Uh, we see the same growth for the on the underlying infrastructure and, and, and the outlook for such um, infrastructure. And we serve the same economic activity. So 
uh, in preparation for this webinar, I didn't want to answer my own questions. So we're going to we go to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to inform you that you can enjoy the Arizona State Sales Tax Incentive at age five. It is a program that is promoted by the GPEC and administered by the Arizona Commerce Authority, the ACA. This is a transaction privilege tax TPT and use tax exemption program for computer data center and operation and expansion. So uh, like I was saying in preparation for this meeting, I did not want to answer my own questions. So I thought it would be a good idea to get some testimonials from some, some of our partners of some of the folks that are most um, involved into this market. So 451 Research, a very well-known reputable analyst in the marketplace, uh, did a study for multi-tenant data center market uh, last year and highlighted Phoenix as an up-and-coming market. This is basically a very low risk market uh, from a geographical perspective, and we'll see that in the next slide. But having the comfort that most of the large scale, hyperscale and cloud service providers in the world are calling Phoenix home, it only generates a larger demand. Uh, and for that reason, we have uh, more competitors in market, but demand brings more demand and supply brings more demand. So sort of to the same points that Chris was making in his presentation. Now, when we look at Phoenix, one of the most attractive things are the low power costs, lower than national average. We were to uh, talk about San Diego just because California is easy to look at and, and something that was being highlighted by Chris as well. Uh, San Diego power rates fluctuate anywhere from 20 to 48 cents per kilowatt hour, whereas Phoenix is on average conveniently below seven cents a kilowatt hour. If we go to the next slide, we can see how easy it is to make the decision to come to market. Uh, when we look at uh, uh, the low natural disaster risks involved in the market are very convenient and very favorable for any mission critical application and, and companies seeking the sort of resiliency and security and reliability to be able to obtain the efficiencies that any mission critical environment deserves. Uh, Phoenix is just uh, a phenomenal place to be able to collocate uh, that environment. Let's go to the next slide. So by, by way of testimonials, we can go to the next slide. I went ahead and surveyed a few folks. I had the privilege to talk to uh, the market um, vice president and general manager for the Southwest at Expedient, a large uh, cloud service provider. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Bethany, thank you. Um, they basically made the decision because of the same reasons that were uh, shared by Chris, uh, the technology innovation, the great workforce, the ability to be able to service the enterprise cloud and um, digital infrastructure and information technology for disaster recovery and cloud native applications is, is second to none. Um, a good friend of mine, um, Michael Ortiz, also decided to uh, have a uh, start his practice here at headquarter his practice here with uh, Kaiser Digital Infrastructure Group. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, he basically was uh, the vice president of collocation and I'm sorry, site selection for uh, Dupont Fabros. Uh, prior to serving at Digital Realty, that company got acquired by Digital Realty um, a couple of years back. Uh, during that time, he was chasing the same CSPs that actually brought the demand to Phoenix and that brought our competitors to Phoenix and that actually initiated uh, the quest for H5 to be able to find uh, the same ability to satisfy the demand for that our customers are asking for with the acquisition of Nextford uh, late 2015, actually close January 2016. But if we go to the next slide, um, we have other players in the, in the, in the space that call Phoenix home. Um, Joe Ryan, uh, formerly uh, building my, uh, global data centers for Microsoft, decided to establish his own practice here in the Valley uh, because he saw the robust national demand and international demand for data centers. Um, 
But Phoenix in the United States is only like in Ashburn and the largest data center market in the world for those that are not in the data center world. Uh, so Phoenix is quickly becoming the Ashburn of the West. And that's, those are large words and hard to explain, but uh, the demand and the velocity in construction support that. And then lastly, uh, our friends at JLL. So General Slang and LaSalle, uh, another maverick in the, in, in the space, in the um, data center space, uh, Mark Bauer and his son, Kevin Bauer, uh, basically summarized it very eloquently. You know, here in Phoenix, you can find extremely low risk from natural disasters, great place to do business, 20 year uh, exemption from sales tax as illustrated before, reliable and affordable, uh, and affordable power supply, and then very strong connectivity coming through the market. So that's my presentation for today. I, I really appreciate the time and the opportunity. So I'd like to turn it back to you, Eric. Thanks so much. And thank you so much, Gino. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I want to bring Andrew into the conversation now. Uh, Andrew is the CEO for Kudelski Security, a global security solutions firm. Uh, Kudelski focuses on innovative solutions to tough security challenges around the globe across every vertical with operations in North America, Europe, and soon to be Asia. Uh, he is a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Council. Andrew, thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, you've heard from all of our panelists. And now let's give you your opportunity uh, to share as well. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I'm a big advocate for the work that GPEC is doing, and I'm happy to talk about our journey uh, in the Phoenix area. Uh, so today I'd like to kind of briefly talk to you about Kodelsky Security, and why we're in Phoenix, and, and the goals, and our goals and objectives in the market and in the area. So next slide, please. Uh, I'm the CEO of Kodelsky Security. We're a portfolio company inside the Kodelsky Group. Founded in 1951 in Switzerland. Uh, we're a Swiss company traded on the Swiss exchange um, and had been in the security space for a long time. Uh, one of the core portfolio companies for the group is called Nagra, uh, and they're the market leader in digital content uh, protection, primarily in the media space, uh, whether that's satellite information or cable box information or uh, new media. Uh, we tend to be the company that protects that content. Uh, and that's where historically the company has played. And over time, they've done acquisitions and new starts to grow into new markets. Um, another portfolio company is Skidata. They're the market leader in public access solutions. So if you ski on any ski slope in the world virtually, you're likely using their system. Uh, looks like we've gone forward this long. If you uh, visit many airports throughout the United States, you're parking in their system, you're parking in their airports, you're parking in their parking lots. Uh, and they're involved uh, in many NFL stadiums for higher tickets work, so public access security. Uh, then I work in the Kelsky Security Group as the CEO, where we focus on cybersecurity solutions. Uh, those companies combined uh, just short of a billion dollars in revenue, uh, 65 offices located in 32 countries, uh, initially with a headquarters in Europe outside Geneva, Switzerland, and Lausanne, uh, Chiseau de Lausanne area. Uh, we moved our headquarters, our U.S. headquarters into Phoenix um, a few years ago, and today uh, we run a two-headquarters system, one in Phoenix, uh, one in Switzerland. Most of our executives group-wide have moved into the Phoenix area. Most of our back office operations, including all of the leadership from finance to accounting to IT to the rest, uh, most of those assets have moved into the Phoenix area, and uh, we really do run a true two-headquarters system across all of our group portfolio companies. Uh, obviously, I'm in the cybersecurity business, so I'll focus my time there briefly, but kind of where we are, and, and this is to Chris's point about kind of our strategy, which initially was very focused on back office operations, but as we've grown our security business, uh, we've been focused on putting uh, capability into the Phoenix market. Uh, as a cybersecurity business, we help clients primarily in the enterprise space, big commercial companies, protect their intellectual property, protect their client data and protect them from breaches. We primarily provide that through a managed service. So we take on security on behalf of the client. Uh, and we have hundreds of clients across the globe, well-known brands uh, using our, our capability, our platform to protect uh, their infrastructure, their data, 
their employees as well as their clients. We base that capability out of Phoenix. So we run that business unit out of Phoenix. We have a large monitoring center in Scottsdale um, and we are uh, growing that capability with Phoenix as the hub. There's a mirror facility in Switzerland uh, that primarily serves European clients. Um, and we've been run this quite successfully in this kind of two headquarter, two operation center mentality. Um, and we like the Phoenix area for a couple of reasons. You know, one is uh, access to talent, uh, to great like access to the university systems, uh, as well as just accessing the technical schools and other um, the talent pool generally technically. I think we're also, we've had great luck in the data center space to the previous gentleman's presentation. Uh, we run a fairly large data center in the Phoenix area. Uh, we, we have been quite pleased not only with the rates, but the access and the stability. Um, and then finally, we're just hiring a lot of technical employees uh, and the lifestyle and the cost of living access in the Phoenix area is really nice uh, for the type of employees that uh, want to work for a company like us. They, they want to work in an innovative, technically challenging environment. Uh, want to work with high-end customers to solve high-end problems, uh, but they also want the ability to live an, an outdoor lifestyle and enjoy the, the beautiful scenery and the lifestyle that the Phoenix area offers. So uh, we, we've been quite pleased with that. Uh, and, and I'll also say that what I've uh, really been impressed with the Phoenix area is, is uh, kind of the community of other technical security firms and other technical firms in general that are in the area. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we, uh, due to some customer demand, got rather involved in the blockchain space, uh, helping companies that were doing uh, transactions on top of using blockchain for transactions inside their ecosystems or wanting to get involved in exchanges or wanting to accept cryptocurrency as payments. Uh, there's a big security need there. We got involved uh, with GPEX help. We were able to identify some resources inside Arizona State that were able to help us. We actually helped stay at the center there. Uh, we're also able to access companies in the area that were in that space and need help. Uh, so there's a nice ecosystem of other technical companies that uh, we can lean on both as customers but also just as partners. Um, all in all, uh, Phoenix is a great area for us. Um, enjoy the work we're able to do there as we try and grow as an innovation kind of focused company. Uh, Phoenix is the right home for us uh, in the United States. Um, and I look forward to answering any questions anyone has. Uh, I appreciate the time. Andrew, thank you so much. And yeah, we do have a few moments here. Uh, before we get to final remarks, we do have some questions coming in. Um, before I read some cold, I want to address Peter. Uh, uh, Peter, question coming in for you here. Uh, and I love this question. Honeywell develops and manufactures various products in Greater Phoenix. Uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about some of those products that might surprise them? Because I think all of us in this area know Honeywell, have heard of Honeywell, but some of us don't know what is created out of Honeywell. Um, lots of things are created out of Honeywell. So, so some of the ones you've probably seen in the, in the news lately, um, obviously a lot of press and the kind of outside of our aerospace um, perspective, but the, the, the PPE equipment and the masks that obviously we're producing out of our repurposed our engines facility here in, in Phoenix to produce masks for the, you know, the, the pandemic that's going on right now. So I think that's something um, as, as a company, we've been really, really proud of how we've been able to pivot and really um, create jobs in, in the market. I mean, we're looking at potentially between five and a thousand jobs here and we're creating over 5 million masks right now for that. So, so that's one, I just kind of, I think that's something as a company we're really proud of. Um, but as you mentioned, we are, we are, we basically produce, um, equipment in Phoenix that go tip to tail on pretty much every aircraft platform that you have out there. Um, everything from a displays, um, cockpits, weather radars, navigation of the aircraft to engines and auxiliary power units. Um, you know, we are on about 80% of all the air commercial air airlines from an auxiliary power unit and they all get produced here in Phoenix. So again, that's something that's, that's really great. Um, and it's everything we do wills, we do brakes. Um, one thing that's probably um, gets lost a little bit because we hear a lot about the commercial side of the house and the airlines and the, the business aviation, but we have a really big defense, um, oh, sorry, I should say space organization that's based in that Glendale facility. Um, and, and we have product that comes out of that organization that has precision gyros, um, actuation, um, attitude adjustments to really help satellites and space shuttles kind of do what they need to do in space there. Um, we've been on 90% of NASA missions uh, throughout history. 
And so that's something that we're really proud of that we produce here. That's high tech um, and it requires high skill sets and bringing very knowledgeable aerospace and um, you know, software and electrical and mechanical engineering. Um, so that's probably something that's a little less known on that side of it than uh, some of our commercial areas. All right, thank you, Peter. Uh, Chris, want to bring you into the conversation, I have a question coming in. Um, you know, at the top, you did mention the knowledge worker and then throughout the discussion today, we've heard the panelists talk about the importance and the demand for that knowledge worker. So what is Arizona doing to remain a leader in jobs creation, direct investment, both over the short and the long haul? Yeah, Eric, so obviously uh, the region has experienced tremendous job growth. Uh, the, the kind of post-recession, the last recession, so say from 2012 to about 2019, we've been a top five state for job growth. And what we've really worked to transition and a lot of the examples that the panelists gave is we wanna to continue to, to move up the value chain because when, when these kind of business units select to come to Greater Phoenix or expand, in Honeywell's examples, expand in Greater Phoenix, that creates a lot of indirect jobs because other business units need to be here. And so, you know, what we're trying to do is really ensure that we have an insulation against uh, what we call non-tradable sectors. So on, on the, you know, economy side, you have tradable and non-tradable sectors. When we're creating products that get sold outside the state of Arizona or outside the country, that creates economic and, and general wealth for our, our citizens. And so more of those jobs that are created allows for an insulation against a downturn, as opposed to say a retail or restaurant or uh, you know, single family housing uh, role, while very important in a healthy economy, you don't want those to be the drivers because when that valve turns off or slows, uh, that's what created the, the 2008 crisis. And so again, what are we doing? Uh, we are out on the front lines telling our story to the world. And just this last year, we just closed our books in June, 42 new companies selected this market. And uh, over the past three years, uh, we've had almost 150 new companies enter the region. And, and these are companies like you know, the Andrew, that Andrew runs with Kadelsky and many others are adding massive job counts here. So it's kind of an interesting you know, paradigm where you've got a lot of these high valued business units and companies coming here, coupled with, we have to ensure that you know, we have jobs available for all citizens. And I think that's what the pandemic has opened my eyes to even more so than it did before is a lot of the job loss that we've experienced has been in, in areas, tourism affected businesses, small businesses, the ultra small, those are the, the industries and, and jobs that have dislocated or been contracted. So we have to focus on both segments and ensure that you know, we're getting liquidity support to small business while we're out on the front lines trying to recruit more Honeywell business units, more H5 you know, companies and enterprise uses and co-location operators in addition to like Kadelsky, you know, really hyper uh, focused cybersecurity and, and IT and software companies. And so that's kind of the full gamut of what we have to do. Okay. And on that note, uh, I want to bring Andrew back into the conversation. Question coming in just for, for you and on the theme of, uh, of the worker. Uh, when you think about developing a workforce to meet demand for those new skills that you had mentioned, how are you thinking about developing the skills of your workforce in terms of recruiting new workers and upskilling current workers? That's a great question. And this is uh, a question that is impacting people in the high tech industry across the board. They're, they're, particularly in cybersecurity, uh, there are just not enough skilled workers out there uh, to meet the demand. And in fact, uh, the core service we provide to clients, which is the ability to help them with their security, we're often brought in because this is the problem the client faces. They, they can't find the time of baby. So we somewhat inherit their problem. Uh, we have had great success uh, with a couple of different approaches uh, in, the, in the Phoenix, Greater Phoenix area. First is uh, we've implemented in-house training to allow us to bring in less skilled workers and train them into more skilled positions. Uh, th this is pretty much a requirement for any high-tech company these days. Uh, if you're going to be successful in the market and scale the way you need to. Uh, we've had success bringing in people from technical schools, um, or who had job experience, but not the right credentials and training them up. Uh, and then secondly, through apprentice programs, we've had success bringing in local college and high school students um, and converting them into full-time employees once they graduate. Um, and I think uh, the most important aspect here is that you gotta go focus on it. You can't just expect the talent to be there, you're gonna hire it. 
Um, you've got to you got to work on your well. Phoenix, like every other market, is, is full of great talent. You got to put some work in to find it. We've had success in the Phoenix area. Yeah, thank you for that, Andrew. And, uh, you know, Peter, a same question for you, because you, you talked about developing your workforce as well, um, in terms of recruiting new workers while also upskilling your current workforce. Yeah, I mean, I think um, ver very similar in what, what Andrew mentioned there. We spend a lot of time in, in the university relations. So that, that's a big um, pipeline for us, especially in our technical and engineering spaces, um, you know, with the state universities and, and some of the technical programs that we have in state. Um, it is you know, a combination of, of really engaging early in those programs, helping to shape and understand kind of what, what are some of the technical um, trends and needs that we're going to need from the organizational and kind of from a, from a product uh, innovation perspective to make sure those are the skill sets that we're seeing coming out into the market to the degrees. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time there. Um, we also have very extensive um, training programs. Um, quite honestly, it, it is taking, um, you know, current employees and upskilling them through through different development program type activities. So uh, it's a combination um, of driving, you know, you know, across the university landscape as well as job, uh, job training programs. Great. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, Gino, question for you coming in. Um, what do you see as the data infrastructure needs in the future? It was a great question as well. So uh, in the future, I think we'll see more sporadic infrastructure that is going to come going to continue to congregate and aggregate in certain uh, certain central points like data centers uh, therefore in, in in sort of uh, the example of our footprint our national footprint we have a multitude of both a mix of uh, edge and enterprise data centers where um, the workforce is going to be more distributed uh, the work it workloads are going to be more distributed as well they're going to need uh, that enhanced security uh, workforce that needs to come in to be able to um, reaffirm the resiliency that 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 it can afford in order for business to run. I mean, businesses before used to have to keep the lights on in a, a brick and mortar uh, retail location. That's no longer the case. Now your brick and mortar is dig is digitized. And that needs to reside in, in a computer that needs to be secure and then needs to be collocated in either with a cloud service provider and the cloud service provider ultimately needs the data center. Yeah, and Gino, as we wrap up here, I'll give you a, a 30, 45 seconds here for some final remarks just to kind of wrap up everything you heard today from the panelists, some great information, some great insights and perspective on things. Um, what's your takeaway from today's panel? Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that, Eric. Um, you know, so hearing the panelists here, I hear that this is sort of the perfect storm. I'm, I mean, uh, the greater uh, Phoenix metro area provides, you know, an area of, of, of low risk that allows for ultimate uptime reliability and, and resiliency and resulting in ultimate security. Uh, the tax incentives that are put in place in order to motivate businesses to relocate to Phoenix um, allow for that our on-demand society to provide that, that is now providing a near real-time sort of uh, service and offering product, uh, bringing it closer to real-time, right? Uh, so that encompassed with, you know, attractive power cost, uh, now is, is, is a big ecosystem, right? So this big ecosystem uh, has a lot of momentum. It's a big market, lots of competition, lots of demand, like I said before, Demand brings more demand and supply to the market brings more demand. Uh, thank you, Gino. And Andrew, let's bring you in now. Again, a lot of common themes, a lot of common perspectives um, in the last hour. Um, what are your takeaways? Uh, I think some of Chris's commentary earlier around, uh, given the, the, the environment we're living in with, with the coronavirus uh, is uh, gonna make changes to the way we all operate in that, uh, you know, when I, when I hear from the other speakers as well as Chris is, is that uh, we all kind of rethink about kind of how we operate and where we're hiring and where we're placing employees and what attracts employees, what we, um, what we offer. And uh, you know, I think uh, acknowledgement that the way we hire employees has changed. I mean, it used to be that the employees moved to us and now we moved to the employees. And, um, as I think we've common the common themes you hear in this presentation today are that 
Um, we've been all of us have been successful in Greater Phoenix area, making that happen in, uh, in all likely positions as well for the future. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. And Peter, let's bring you in now. Uh, same same thing. You know, we've heard a lot today, and you know, Andrew was talking about you know the adjustments we've had to make recently uh, during the COVID pandemic. So, what are your final thoughts after hearing from the panelists? Yeah, I mean, I think I echo Gino's comment around demand generates demand, right? I mean, I think the the opportunity as more and more, and I've been I've been in Phoenix now for 28 years, um, and the landscape in Phoenix has changed significantly around you know what who we are as, as, as a state, as a, you know, the economic environment um, and seeing and hearing from, from the panelists here around what's coming to the state and the capabilities that are being developed. Um, they drive partnering opportunities. So for like on a Honeywell perspective, I look at it as partnering opportunities, but it's also bringing more workers. It's bringing more skill. Um, and, and to your point, you know, things are changing the way we work, the way we hire the type of worker. Um, again, I, I just, um, I'm excited to see how we continue to develop Phoenix. Um, it's very strategic for us from a Honeywell perspective and our ability with companies like we talked about today to be able to you know, leverage uh, and work with them and partner and those and others um, is, is, is exciting. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. And Chris, we'll bring you back. You know, you started this discussion with that great report on the Nerve Center, and then you've got to hear from all of our panelists today, you know, address some of those things that you brought up. So very curious to hear your takeaways. Well, I do know one thing, Eric, is I'm going to bring Peter and Andrew and Gino into my next pitch. Uh, great, great handle on what's going on in the market and, and have very similar thoughts, it sounds like, on kind of where we need to go as a community. Uh, they touched on some, I think, very interesting um, commentary around the world has changed. Transformation was underway before COVID, probably more accelerated now. The digital footprint of companies and, and how uh, the workforce is going to be enabled or even maybe required is probably the better word moving forward. Um, I think of deployment systems, I, I think of all these companies, whether it's Infosys or IntraEdge, General Assembly, tech systems, I've probably been in more short-term training, very specialized training conversations uh, with community colleges, ASU, and all these short-term delivery mechanisms because the, the education delivery system as we know it is being changed. And I, I think we as leaders, and this is really challenging because it's like moving a ship, but if, if we're able to take this pause uh, that we're experiencing through COVID to reset the way we think about uh, digital instruction, a combination of physical and digital instruction, adaptive learning, uh, we've, we've already have a long history of that, but imagine if we became the epicenter of that delivery system. And also focusing like on what Pipeline AZ, I know they've been on in the past. It's all about matching job skills with uh, the individuals that need to be trained. And I think a question, you know, came in earlier that I think is really important is, and we have 250,000 people that were dislocated through this process that are going to need to have retraining and some upskilling. And to Andrew's point about apprenticeships, uh, internally looking at corporate training models, it's, it's a combination of all these things. We do that well, and we're, we're unstoppable as a market. And, and I live this every day. And so, you know, I'm one that gets to see how these markets are operating. We are unstoppable if our labor delivery system meets the needs of companies. And so we need to triple down on that and that be our focus. I, I love that, Chris. Um, and, and panelists, before we let you go, uh, we're going to do a screenshot here in just a moment. Um, just one last thing here. I do want to mention again, as we at the top of the show, the GPEC Ambassador Program uh, will be hosting a virtual social hour on Wednesday, July 29th from 4 to 5. Again, that'll be via Zoom. Exclusive event for GPEC investors. If you're not an investor uh, but would like to learn more, please reach out to that engagement team. Nicole's email is right there on your screen. Um, and again, thank you to all the panelists for joining us today on the 16th installment of the Regional Report. Future Regional Reports will be announced soon, and you can always check out past reports by visiting GPEC's website, uh, gpec.org backslash blog.